I think maybe Louise or Gabby, because this is the first time that we've been able to see each other's face in a, over a year. As you know, the CDC has said that if you are vaccinated um, and have been, you know, in the period of time, the waiting period, that you no longer need to wear a mask. So we'll go along with the CDC and do as they say. So you're welcome if you're not or if you're just concerned or whatever, you are certainly welcome to wear a mask. And we are not going to check credentials or anything else. Um, to know whether or not folks have been vaccinated. So, welcome to seeing one another's faces again. So, what's new? What's the, what do we need, Jack? I'm I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. You didn't need to. Yeah. I know, six months older than you. He loves this time of year because he lets he just lets me have it for that. Uh, announcements, anything else? Um, we have communion next week, and we have, of course, been doing communion where we have the little bags with the elements in it. I don't think we need to do that now, given the fact that we don't need masks, etc. So what I'd kind of like you to tell me is, are you ready to go back to intinction as we had been doing it, where you come forward? Or would you like one more time, because you won't have communion again until August, would you like one more time with the bags just for that safety? Okay, what else, folks? Anybody else? I, I, I see this and I see this, but nobody's saying a word. I agree. Okay. Everybody say aye. <laughs> Session, you're voting on this. Everybody say aye. aye. Okay, now it's official. <laughs> okay, other announcements? Anything else? There's a sign up sheet on the table out there for the blueberries. Um, that we get through for Mission Central's fundraiser. So when you pass that, take a look at that. Okay, let's worship together. Please stand for the call to worship. <clears throat> Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us worship the Lord. If anybody looked at the calendar, or if you had the right kind of calendar, it would have told you that Thursday was Ascension Day. And that's important. Ascension Day is 40 days after Easter, and from there until Pentecost is 10 more. And Penta, of course, is 5, 50. Um, so that will be coming next week. Ascension Day is important, though, for a number of reasons. So I just wanted to pay a little bit of attention to it. Here's the passage from the beginning of the book of Acts that talks about it. After he said this, Jesus he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. 
Okay. Well, there's a number of reasons that the ascension is important to us as Christians. First of all, it marks the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. Okay? He is now gone. He is in, in heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, he is the high priest. So whenever we do anything for which we should ask repentance, Jesus is the one that turns to the Father and says, it's okay, I got it covered. Okay? That's what he does. Him, if he was still here on earth, him being present on earth would, would stop the Holy Spirit from being able to come. And so when he ascends and is no longer here, that opens up everything for the Spirit to come to each of us on Pentecost, okay? He is in heaven preparing a place for us. He tells us that. And then showing himself here on earth after the resurrection and then ascending says to us that after our own death and resurrection, we're going to have bodies too. We're not just spiritual, you know, clouds that kind of float around. There's a body and a body that can be recognized and touched and all yet that, but yet a body that has different attributes than just a human body. And then finally, what the angel said, you're seeing him go, he'll come back the same way. So it gives us an idea of what to expect um, as we look heavenward for the future. Okay, would you stand please for the prayer of confession? Source of all wisdom, you have called us to honor your word and shower us with your blessings when we have followed your counsel. You have sent your spirit to purify us deep within so that we may follow your way with hearts of purpose, even when other voices and inner desires call us away from you. Yet we have disregarded your precepts and grieved your sanctifying spirit. In your mercy, forgive us for resisting you. By your boundless love, draw us near to yourself, that with joy and gratitude, we may honor you faithfully in all that we say and do. In your name and through your power, may we bear abundant fruit of beauty and wholeness. In your son's name, forgive us. Amen. As Jesus reached out in healing love to those who sought relief from their suffering, so God comes to all who earnestly seek a new life. Our creator fills these earthen vessels with God's own glory and power. The spirit lifts us up and restores us to wholeness that we may go forward confident in our forgiveness and empowered to speak words of truth. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now arise, O Lord God, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. 
May your priests, O oh Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your saints rejoice in your goodness. The psalmist tell us that you inhabit the praise of your people, and anywhere that anyone begins to worship you, you come to dwell. Father of truth, Lord above all, you are creator and we stand in awe at the works of your hand, the ways of your heart. This is the cry of your people, this is the cry of When your spirit draws near, your will is made known. This is the cry of your people. This is the cry. Father, it seems so good to be able to see each other's faces again. So good to see the words being spoken, the smiles, the scowls, all of the different emotions that a face has. We're so thankful for this community. Thankful to be able to gather once again and to be able to, to laugh and sing and, and do all of that. Lord, small churches are much like the early church. Gather together in small groups and share your word and worship and pray. Share meals together. So over 2,000 years, with a small church, not much of that has changed. And we're grateful that we get to know each other's lives in intimate ways. 
share the good times of celebration and share the times of tears and grief and loss. We're thankful for all of it. We ask that you be with those whose names were mentioned. Bring them to healing. Help them strengthen their faith and let them know that you are with them, that you are guiding them and comforting them. We ask, Lord, that you be with our nation as we struggle with so many issues right now. All the children coming across the border, Lord, be present with them. Help us to know what to do. And Lord, this day we ask you to be with your chosen people, with the nation of Israel. And not only that, but with the Palestinians too. They're all your children. Guide them to peace, Lord. Stop the bombs. Let them find a way to live together in community. Be with us, Lord. Grant us your strength and power, your words, your wisdom, your vision for the future. And we ask all these things in the name of your Son, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The date was April 23rd, 1962. The place was the Rockefeller Chapel at the University of Chicago. And the speaker was Dr. Karl Barth, one of the premier theologians of the 20th century. In fact, Pittsburgh Seminary uh, in the corner of the library has a place corned off and in it are his desk, where he did all his writing, and his, his pens, his inkwell, his papers, uh, his chair, all of it. And it's, it's a piece of Christian history that is worth preserving by all means. Karl Barth was a prolific writer. And his works cover shelves and shelves. His, his systematic theology is epic with everyone. But at the Rockefeller Chapel that day, as he was taking questions from students after his speech, one of them asked him, if you could condense your theology into one sentence, what would it be? And Bart replied, I would sing the words of a song I learned at my mother's knee. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. A lifetime of deep theological thinking, and he condenses it into Jesus loves me. Other folks along the way have pretty much said the same thing, that for most of us, we begin our faith journey as children with the simple knowledge that Jesus loves us. That's the first thing we learn. And we spend our lives studying and reading and praying to delve deeper into what that means. And then at the end, we come back to the one thing we knew at the beginning. Jesus loves me. Listen to uh, God's word to us today. This is from John's first letter to the churches in Asia Minor. 
We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son in his life has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. John's um, argument is very, very simple. In fact, most good theological arguments are just that. They are simple statements of fact, of belief in the faith. And his words are clear. But those words are now being challenged and diluted by the churches of Asia Minor. And that was changing everything. There is a heresy afoot, and John is firmly refuting what is happening. Now, the heresy is called Gnosticism, and that begins with a G, G N O S T, and on it goes. And what it meant was that these folks didn't really think Jesus was God. That he, he was a really good guy, and he was a great teacher, but he wasn't God. At his baptism, they believed that Jesus was endowed with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not unusual because that's what they used to believe. Saul had been given the Spirit. Um, David had been given the Spirit, Samuel had been given the Spirit, but they also believed that at his death, the Spirit left, and he died just like any other man, and what he left behind were his teachings, which is another part of Gnosticism. Gnosticism believes that you can know by learning, that you can know yourself. Well, there was folks that were buying into that. Now remember, this is like 80 AD, so no longer are there people alive who have witnessed the resurrection. It's been 50 years or so since that. So it's kind of hard if you don't know someone who's seen it and can say that to you to believe it, right? Um, I mean, really, did it really matter all that much if Jesus was God or wasn't? Weren't his teachings going to be the same regardless? What's the big deal? <laughs> well, the fact is there is a huge big deal if you don't get that part right. I want you to, to picture like shooting a bow and arrow. You start out, right, and you pull back and aim at your target. Well, if your aim is just that much off from here, by the time that arrow gets where it's going, it's that much off. It makes a difference where you start from. So if you start with the premise that Jesus was just a man like we were, you're firing out there into nothingness. No resurrection, no forgiveness, no eternal life. And John said to the communities, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. It matters a lot. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, in God's economy, people never questioned what was true. You grew up in the village that you were born in. You became whatever your father was, a farmer, a carpenter, a shoemaker. You believed what everyone else in the village believed, and you did what everyone else in the village did, and there really were no other choices that anybody knew about. 
And so villages had their village church and they had their village priest. And that church was the center of their whole lives at the time. That's not true anymore. With the advent of the printing press, things began to change. I want you to go back to the early 1500s to when Martin Luther tacked those 95 theses up on the church door in Wittenberg. Those were taken then, and, and for one of the first times in history, they were laid to print and printed and distributed throughout Europe. That was new teachings. And then books were written. And people's minds suddenly were open to all kinds of new ideas. They called it the Enlightenment for obvious reasons. So fast forward a few hundred years and here we are today. Thanks to TV and the internet and social media and all of that, we are overwhelmed by constant new ideas and enticing things from every direction. We don't know for sure anymore who or what to believe in. We live in what sociologists call a time of relativity. Everything's relative. Everything's up for discussion. There's no longer what we would call the absolute truth with a capital T. Whatever somebody wants to believe, whatever they feel works for them, well, that's just fine. The Christian faith has become just another relative good in a society filled with relativity. A simple set of beliefs with no depth and no backbone. It's been reduced to, well, if I'm, if I'm a good person, I'll go to heaven. And we know that's not true. And John just said it. We put our Christian faith into this big mixing bowl. We threw in a few heresies of our own along the way. We added a smattering of New Age spirituality. Threw in some pop culture stuff about how we all become angels and we all go to heaven. We don't become angels ever. Threw in a little modern psychology some personal empowerment stuff and human rights. And we mixed it all together and came up with what we call modern Christianity. And the masses believe that's it. Because they never bothered to know any better. I am not altogether sure whether I, what I am about to say is very bad news, or it's the beginning of some very good news. I think our culture has turned the corner on this relativity stuff in the last couple of years. I think we've gone beyond the I'm okay, you're okay, you do what you want, I'll do what I want, and we just won't bother each other. We've gone beyond that to the I am right, and you are not only wrong, but you are a stupid, racist hillbilly. That's what that whole wokeness movement is all about. I woke up to all the things I used to believe that are silly, and now I know that I was wrong about them, but I am with it now. I'm woke. I understand. And I'm so sure of myself now that I am willing to scream at you about how wrong you are. Now, those of us who still believe the old-fashioned truth about truth with a capital T, we're being chastised for that. We're being lumped together with racists and ultra patriots and bigots and sometimes it's even more than that sometimes it's persecution like cancel culture if you don't go along 
closing churches, burning churches, a race resting pastor, uh, putting businesses out of business by not taking their ads online anymore, all of those different things. Now, that sounds horrid, but like I said, ultimately it might be a very good thing because if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to know who and what you believe in. It won't be okay anymore just to live as a cultural Christian. You won't do it. You're going to be challenged. And you had better be able to defend your faith. Either Christians will believe in Jesus Christ, or they're not going to call themselves Christians anymore. It would be just too dangerous to do that. But, and this is a big but, those who do believe in Jesus Christ will know the difference and being persecuted will be okay with them. How can that be? Why would it be? Because of the Holy Spirit. Like the ancient martyrs before us and those throughout the ages who have died for their faith, those who truly know Jesus Christ have the spirit within them and are given eternity now and they know it in the spirit there is a holiness a purity a, a righteousness that the world lacks and and I think this is part of what Jesus called his joy because we know it we celebrate the gift of eternal life in the now every day of our lives we know that our sins are gone, that temptations and addictions can be overcome, and that we have been and can be transformed by that power within us. Whatever evil or mistakes or sins we've made don't haunt us forever. Believing in Jesus and following God's commandments gives us a surety about eternal life that the world cannot know. In God, there is life. And so for us, living our eternal lives in the now means that there, there's no fear. Bring on the cancel culture. Death no longer terrifies, no longer holds us hostage in fear or determines our behavior. We have this drive, this power, this desire within us for creative purpose. In God there is love. Jesus loves me, this I know. And living our eternal life in the now means that bitterness disappears, jealousies dissolve, Anger dissipates, our horizons grow, and our hope for the future becomes limitless. Believing in Jesus Christ and living out what you believe has eternal ramifications. It matters. There's nothing relative about a man dying on a cross, saving us from sin, and giving us eternal life. So my friends, in an age of relativity, there's nothing relative about being a Christian. That's why we gather in community every week to lift one another up, just like the village church, to worship, to read the sacred words, to find courage to speak hard words of hope to others, <coughs> to affirm to one another what we dare to believe in an age with no truth with a capital T. And John said it, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Choose life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Would you stand, please? Let's affirm our faith with the Confession of 1967. <coughs> God's reconciliation in Jesus Christ is the ground of the peace, justice, and freedom among nations, which all powers of government are called to serve and defend. The church, in its own life, is called to practice the forgiveness of enemies and to commend to the nations as practical politics the search for cooperation and peace. This search requires that the nations pursue fresh and responsible relations across every line of conflict, even at risk to national security, to reduce areas of strife and to broaden international understanding. Although nations may serve God's purposes in history, the church which identifies the sovereignty of any one nation or any one way of life with the cause of Christ denies the lordship of Christ and betrays its calling. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest without you. my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need Oh God. 
my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. I want to see you. That's the difference. Grape jelly. Okay, those of you at home, oh, I wish you could join us with telling your God stories too. Um, but the offering plate is here, and you know what you need to do at home. Let's thank God with the doxology. Praise God from all the saints Filled with the power of your spirit, you send us into the world to radiate the joy of new life. Accept our efforts and make them productive in fulfilling your will. Enhance our gifts through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Challenge us to be obedient to the call of Jesus Christ upon all of our lives, to walk in his faithfulness, and to respond with joy to the tasks you set before us. In his name we pray, amen. Over and over again in the letters and in the Gospels of the New Testament, what we hear is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's no cultural Christianity to that. Believe he was who he said he was. Trust in that and be saved. And now go in peace. And may the love of God, the grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.